Here's a quote I quite like by Richard Hamming. The purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. I sometimes like to think Hamming meant insight, like in the sense of visible, like our destination is insight. We can finally see the purpose of computing. We can see where we're going. Of course, what he really means is insight, actual understanding. Now, in this course, we assign you a ton of numerical problems, numericals, problems that involve a lot of computation. And why do we do that? Just to torture you with complicated computations? No, the reason to do numerical problems is to gain insight, not just to find out the answer, but to gain actual understanding. Through experiments, we discover patterns. You know, it's how we discover things we couldn't have expected. Now, something similar happens with mathematical proof. Sometimes people think that we search for, that we're providing these proofs in order to know whether the theorem is true or false. But this isn't really why mathematicians have a penchant for proofs. Now, perhaps people, perhaps other mathematicians will, will disagree. But to me, the purpose of a proof isn't fundamentally to verify the truth of something. It's to provide actual understanding. Then through that understanding, that's how we hope to know what's true and what's false. But the real purpose isn't to know that answer. It's to understand the answer. So today, we're going to look at a particular problem. This will be our goal for today. We'll show that for primes p congruent to 1 mod 4, there are integers x and y, so that x squared plus y squared equals p. In other words, primes 1 mod p are sums of two squares. The proof we'll see is an extremely clever proof by Don Zagier. It's inspired by you know, prior work of others. Now, you can find this proof in the hilariously titled article, A One-Sentence Proof That Every Prime 1 Mod 4 Is a Sum of Two Squares. It's really quite a short journal article. It's just one page. And the argument is really quite clever. How does it go? Well, we'll define a set S consisting of triples x, y, and z of natural numbers with the property that x squared plus 4yz equals p. Now, we know that that set S is finite. I mean, in particular, x, y, and z all must be smaller than p. Then we define a function f from S to itself given by an extremely complicated rule, like when x is less than y minus z, then f x, y, z equals x plus 2z, z, y minus x minus z, and so on. Now, where did this function f come from? It's so mysterious. In any case, if you bash it out, you'll find that f of f of x, y, z equals x, y, z. And when a function composed with itself is the identity like this, we call the function an involution. You can think of it as being a pairing up function, which sends an element to its partner and sends the partner back back to that element. So everybody pairs up, except that there's exactly one triple which pairs with itself. Its partner is itself. This is the triple 1, 1, K. Now, at this point, we're very happy that P is congruent to 1 by 4. All right, now, these last two facts, that F is an involution and that there's exactly one triple that pairs with itself, these two facts together imply that there is an odd number of elements of S that the size of s is odd. That's all we wanted to know. That's why this seemingly crazy function f is being invoked. Now we apply this same trick to another involution, the function g from s to itself, which sends x, y, z to x, z, y. Again, g is an involution, a function which pairs up the elements of s. But from before, we know that s has an odd number of elements. And so g cannot pair each element with a different element. There must be something paired with itself. This is a fixed point. But a fixed point of G is a triple where the last two components are the same, like x, y, y. So having found a fixed point of G, we've expressed P as x squared plus 2y squared, which is what we wanted. A prime P 1 mod 4 is a sum of two squares. It's an amazingly clever argument. Whoa. Okay, so that went by pretty quickly. Let's try to break that down a little bit, or maybe let's work out a specific case. Let's say P equals 61. Uh, and just sort of work out what happens numerically in that case to, to get a feeling for what's happening in this argument. Okay, so we're going to let p equals 61, and we've got that set s, right? s consists of triples of natural numbers so that x squared plus 4yz, in this case, is equal to 61. Now, here are all the triples that satisfy that condition, x squared plus 4yz equals 61. There's, uh, you know, finally many of them. Now, we've got this mysterious function f. It's a function from s to itself. And when we compose f with itself, we get the identity on s. It's an involution. f has got this real complicated definition. But let's not focus on the definition too much. Let's just see what happens numerically uh, to these elements of s with p equals 61. And yeah, f is an involution, so it pairs up the elements. But there's, uh, you know, one odd person who's left out, right? The uh, triple 1115 is paired with itself. The whole point of introducing f here is just to conclude that s has an odd number of elements. We'll now bring out another function, g, from s to s, which is also an involution. 
And because there's an odd number of elements of S, there has to be something in S which is paired by G to itself. But in order for G to pair the triple with itself, that just means that the last two components of the triple must be equal. It has to look like X, Y, Y. Well, at this point, we've expressed the prime P as a sum of two squares. It's X squared plus 2Y squared. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to find a way to write a prime, which is 1 mod 4, as a sum of two squares. Now, at this point, I hope you have some kind of feeling. You know, I hope your heart is either filled with, uh, you know, glee or terror at the sight of this proof. And there's a lot that this proof has going for it. You know, I think the structure is, is pretty clear, but there's this function f. And this function f is pretty mysterious, and you gotta wonder where does this function come from? And if the purpose of proofs is to provide insight, not just answers, where's the insight here? Where does this function f come from? So I've got this set s, it's triples of natural numbers, and you know, x, y, z with the property that x squared plus four y, z equals that prime p. And I want to interpret that set geometrically. So I build a square of side length x. So it's an x by x square. That's the x squared term. And then around this square, I'll place four rectangles. These rectangles are y by z rectangles. So the four rectangles correspond to the four y z term. So I've put down p squares, right? I've got x squared, the red square in the middle. And then I've got four rectangles, the four y z term. So this is the triple 382, but I'd get the same exact shape, right? The outline would be exactly the same if I tried to build the 723 triple out of a seven by seven square and four two by three rectangles. Now what's crazy here is that this relationship between these two windmill shapes is actually what the function f is doing. So f sends the triple 382 to the triple 723. f is sending a windmill shape to the other windmill shape that you can get by cutting up the windmill in the other way. So we were thinking of the set s as a set of triples of numbers, and we were thinking of the function f from s to s as some complicated operation on those triples of numbers. But instead, we could think of the set s as a collection of windmill shapes. And the function f takes one of those windmills to another windmill with the same shape, but which is decomposed differently. Let's see a specific example again. Let's set p equals 61. Here is the set s regarded not as a collection of triples of numbers, but as a collection of windmills. Now the function f then pairs up these windmills, pairing up a windmill with a partner, which is the same shape or maybe a mirror image shape. And there's one windmill which is paired with itself. The 11k windmill uh, gets sent to itself. So now this really complicated part of the proof, this definition of the function f, this, this function that seems to come out of nowhere, well, it makes a lot more sense, right? For a given uh, shape, you could build that shape by either using a big red square and small uh, blue rectangles, or by using a little red square using bigger blue rectangles. And the function f is just the function that exchanges between those two different ways of building that particular windmill shape. I like this argument a lot. I mean, in part because it takes something that's really combinatorial and by, you know, shining a geometric light on it, I think makes it a lot more memorable. I think it's a cool story. But I also like it because it, I think it really says something, you know, about the nature of mathematical proof and what we're trying to achieve here. I mean, you can write down a proof uh, where you can follow every single line, you know, and you can see the kind of beautiful edifice, this beautiful building at the end, but you don't know where the scaffolding was. You can't tell how this beautiful building was built. And I think one of the goals of mathematical writing and the goals of proofs in general, you know, isn't just to display this beautiful building, right? It's to empower you, you know, the mathematician, uh, to be able to understand how that thing was constructed, like where was the scaffolding? You know, and in some ways, uh, I think that can make the proof more beautiful. You know, it can be uh, kind of heighten your, your feeling of uh, uh, beauty when you see uh, not only the building, uh, but also, you know, something about how that building was built and how challenging that must have been. I think it's amazing to think of, you know, how, uh, how this function f was originally constructed. You know, was it, was it originally constructed through this sort of geometric method? You know, or was that an insight that was only added later? You know, it's a fascinating question, really. Um, but in any case, I hope you like the proof, uh, and, and I hope it says something to you, you know, about the nature of mathematics and what it is that we're trying to achieve when we're doing mathematics.